Let's hit record. record. Let's hit record. You know, and as every every single episode I say this, we hit record because we end up just chatting before we hit record and all the good stories go away. Exactly. Will, welcome to the show. I appreciate you coming on. You have a book out. Damn the Valley. Let's knock out the book real quick, man. Let's just, you know, we're going to do like two minutes on a book and then later on we'll come back to the book because we're, we're right in the middle of this marketing thing, man. Let's get and into this, it. This. So Damn the Valley, it's about your tour in Afghanistan. And, uh, it was kind of interesting when I, when I was reading through it, you signed up for the 18 x-ray program and you weren't young. I mean, I hate to say you're not young, but let's, let's look at something here when you're this can, I know I'm kind of going off base here, but let's look at it this way. When you're in high school football, boom, you're good to go get in college football. You're around 20, 21. You get picked up for the NFL. You start working the years, you get a little bit older and your, your cutoff date is usually around 32, 33. Now you're 26 when you join the army and you're going into 18 x-ray program, which is essentially the NFL of the army. So you're a little bit older. You're a little bit older. Did you like, and I, I read the, the x-ray where you thought about going to the Marines, but you're like, you had no idea where, where you would end up on the wall. So, uh, 18 X-ray brother. And then, uh, let's talk about that. Yeah. So when I, uh, when I went to sign up, I was just that, the dumb recruit, you know, I mean, I was an adrenaline junkie at the time already and, um, I was doing some, you know, racing cars and stuff. So I love it. And I'm like, all right, you know, life's, life's apart over here. I'm hitting that reset button. I'm getting into the military. Let's just, let's go full on. And I kind of looked at it in the way of, you know, it's 2008. Afghanistan's winding down. I see, I'm a little older. I can see the the writing on the wall and I'm like, eh, you know, who's involved in fighting around the world? Who's constantly got something going on special operations. So that was the reason behind the 18 X-ray program. However, going, going back and the older and wiser that I am now, um, cause I mean, even the recruiter tried telling me, he was just like, look, man, like you, you literally got two things wrong on the ASVAB. Like you can choose anything you want. What do you want to do? And I'm like, no, that's it. Freaking green beret. That's for me. And, um, I think I probably should have gone the Intel route and moved the, you know, put the tools in the box and been more yeah. of an asset by the time getting over there. But you know, I mean, it's who knows if I went that route. You know, number one, this wouldn't have ever gotten written. <laughs> but, well, um, you know, and if yeah. you go Intel route, you don't know what you're going to get into. You know, you True. can end up being like crypto, SIGIN, human, comment, end up on some, you know, outpost in Antarctica listening into like whatever uh, Chinese defense Russians or some else crap. I mean, especially yeah. if you had, especially if, you know, you had a great ASVAB and let's say you took the D lab and they're like, oh, we need someone to speak, you know. To Gallic, you end up in some outposts, you know, end up in some, some ship outside of Philippines. You're like, oh, oh this yeah. is cool. Oh, I know guys that did too. Like, I mean, that's, I was assigned, um, I actually went back to selection after this deployment, smoked it, um, and got assigned Russian. So that was fun. Sorry about that interruption, but let's talk about that 18 X-ray program. And, you know, your initial steps, you go to, you go to Fort Benning, home of the infantry. And what is it now? Is it still home? It's not Fort Benning now. What is it now? Oh, did they change the name of Ben? I wasn't even tracking that. Yeah, I think it's Fort Moore, like for Hal Moore, I think. I thought that was the one in Texas because they, they had that, like the history behind the air cab there and everything. I, I could no, be wrong. Let's look this up now. Let's look yeah, this up. Check it out. So, yeah. So you go to Fort, the what was formerly known as Fort Benning. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> the artist formerly known as Benning. Yeah. <laughs> Which was a fantastic time. I mean, like, so when I was there in basic training, it was just, it was funny because I went into it with that mindset of like, look, this is, this is basic training. Okay. This is the, the, where it all starts. This is the foundation, you know, pay attention and everything, but you're in with a bunch of these 17 and 18 year olds. There was a few older guys, um, but it was almost like our, we were Charlie 119 and it was almost like, they gave us 
a ton of people there were x-ray program. Okay, like a ton. And they had this mission to just beat the snot out of us. Like we started with like all the all the different um companies there, like they had this running list of of how many people they could cut. Like it was like a game to the drill sergeants. And we started out with like 70 some odd people. I think our graduating class was 44, which is weird for I mean that an army really basic weird. training. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that, that, and talk. you know, you think, well, you know, I'm, I keep thinking about your timeline, too, is like, like you said, the wars, and I think that the bigger the the headsheds are probably thinking, okay, we don't need as many infantry, we probably need different types of branches, we don't need as many 18 x-rays, so we have this whole cadre of 18 x-rays, mm. let's kind of weed it down, you, you almost wonder what's going on there. I never thought about it like that, you know, it, it, it is possible, they know what they're doing, there's always that program up running behind the scenes, like the HR and, and the big heads over there, they know what's up. And thanks to Wikipedia, it is now a Fort Moore, there used to be like a Fort Moore back in the day for a different wow. army officer, but yeah, it's Fort okay. Moore crazy well you know what hey hell of a hell of a soldier as well right yeah exactly hell, damn so you got hurt during basic training is that what happened or did you get hurt in um airborne school so i actually got hurt in sopsy it was probably something just compounded along the way um so airborne school i mean wasn't really a big deal you know you just it's kind of how to it's the school of falling you know, every all airborne school, it's like, hey, you, you know, it, as long as you can run and fall out of a plane, you'll be okay. Um, but uh, SOPSI, so the Special Operations Preparation and Conditioning, I always thought it was a phenomenal program. It always gets, you know, they kind of look down on it and some of the Green Beret cadre and stuff that were, and maybe that was just part of the game, you know, but they were um, just phenomenal. There was one guy, a, uh, Sergeant first class Holst and he was just intense. You know I mean? They were all intense, but he was just that like the one and come to find out is more towards the end of us being there is that he was one of the guys from Black Hawk down. Oh. Like, I think he was the second guy fast roping out of the chopper. He was in the same chopper that that guy fell out of. Um, and you know, I mean, he was through the entire Thing up until like he ran the mile with everybody <laughs> out of there and just the stories he had and the intensity um but that being in that atmosphere and having somebody like that as a mentor i never understood why the army and why the 82nd and stuff looked down on these x-rays coming out of these programs because it's like you're getting a better equipped soldier quite honestly and you're getting somebody who's had a little bit more than everybody else even if he didn't make the full program. I mean, you have to look at the drop rates and stuff in selection and then throughout the Q course. I mean, that's a, it's, it has a high, high attrition rate. Well, there's always been this thing between conventional airborne forces and special operations forces always, you know, that's even back like, cause me, you know, when I first joined the army, it was in nineties, you know, I didn't go to the okay. war. I didn't go to the war until oh five oh six. So it was like different you know, yeah. when you're in like the, the BDUs and stuff and you have the conventional forces who never really understood the capabilities of soft forces. And, you know, in the 90s and before that, you know, I'm preaching to the choir, but most of the the alpha teams were, the A teams were more foreign internal defense than they were direct action. Yes. That was actually one of the biggest things and biggest discussions between myself and my platoon sergeant all the time was the fact of like... Like we literally did an SF mission out there. We were doing FID hand in hand with the police we were with living right outside of one of the villages, you know, in a 28 man uh, combat outpost like that. We were doing what teams would do on that end. And they were in and out of our AO all the time. Matter of fact, the, the first manuscript came back from the DOD, you know, with a bunch of black lines and stuff. And I'm like, oh, come on. Like this stuff is, I, but you know, um, I wanted that stamp on it. It didn't really change. You know, I'm glad story. you brought up the the soft cape, the soft in Afghanistan, the stuff too, is because one thing about your book that really I take away is you're writing it from a grunt perspective. Mm -hmm. You always get the the special forces. There's, I mean, how many Green Bray, Navy Seal, um, the market saturated. Are out there? It's saturated, saturated. Yeah. but to get that ground level 
look and to get the view from, you know, the grunt. Yeah. You know, and to go back to my favorite movie, one of my favorite movies, Platoon, it's like having that yes. that look at the grunt level. And I think that's why that movie and that's why the grunt perspective resonates so much. And that's the same and thing with like Band of Brothers and all these other shows. Like when you're looking at the grunt, mm -hmm. that is what resonates. And that is really, I mean, just, and that's because it's so relatable. You know, I mean, it's, um, you are, you're not at these high levels. It's, it's so strange. Like this is kind of a blue ocean in here and it's because you get the DOD approved books or the books about a conventional battle and stuff, but they're all written by someone who really wasn't there. Like it's a general or mm -hmm. a colonel. they weren't the ones that are running, you know, 800 meters into a, a conflict, you know, where suicide bombers just lit themselves up. I'm talking about the 1508 incident in the book. Um, they aren't the ones doing that sort of thing. So to get that view, but then you have the soft guys that put out their books, you know, so a lot of the conventional guys seem marginalized for one mm -hmm. um, and they're, they won't even bring their story forward. But, uh, what a lot of people don't realize is these, the books, a lot of the books that come over from the soft side, the DOD doesn't sign off on them. So they're really military fiction. So, I mean, they, and it's happened before, you know, there's stuff in there where it's kind of embellished, you know? So, I mean, really, I'm like, you got two ends here and I'm like, all right, where can we go in the middle here? Tell the true story. Cause the stuff that happened out there, like there's people that I know that went on further to go in the movie industry and stuff. And they, they've literally said, they're like, there's no way like anybody's ever going to believe that this was a year that happened out there. It was just so kinetic and chaotic. Mm -hmm. Um, but here we are, you know, and uh, I think it was, and that's one of the reasons why too, that it got boiled down into a book that was platoon level. Cause there's just no way that I could have gotten everything in there um, that happened throughout the whole company's time there. I like the other platoon level aspect of it too, is like, you know, so I was enlisted in the nineties and then commission later on. And when you commission and you're a Lieutenant, you want to, you want to ingest as much, nonfiction as possible you want yeah. to find out what it's like to be at that ground level not what it's like to be like you know delta dev group some other you know tip of the spear type thing or what happens at the general or flag officer level because that is what a lot of the books were like back then there wasn't social media when i joined you know mm -hmm. there wasn't this there wasn't that and you but still you don't want that three minute clip on YouTube of what it's like to be in the shit with the grunts. So you want to have something where you could read it and go, oh, okay, these are the dynamics in a platoon. That's one thing I like about like when you're talking about barracks, when you're talking about this, when you're talking about that, when you're talking about the suck, because sometimes when you get in these leadership positions, you forget what it's like to be a human. And I hate to say it like that, but you're, you're so, no, you're right. You're so stuck at this, like, okay, I cannot show emotions. I cannot sympathize with my troops, blah, blah, blah. And I wasn't like that. I was never really like that. But you're going to get a lot of people who like, they forget that they're out there. Yep, yeah. they're out there. And it even, I mean, it even happened with some of this to where, um, you know, you could see it in the way that they would either dehumanize uh, the enemy, you know, or even sometimes the, the lower enlisted, like when we would get in. So we started getting in replacements and... Guys just didn't want to get to know them. You know, uh, they didn't want to put that that human face to it and stuff. And some of them got treated like complete garbage, you know, because of that. Um, but, and that's sort of like an in-between, too, is it's not complete garbage, but it's brunt, curt. It's like that wartime, like it's got to be straight into the point. And if you don't listen... Mm -hmm. You know, right, right now, if you're not snapping to like, it doesn't mean much, but if you're in contact and you have that hesitation, you know, and you're not snapping to like, so they're trying to fix that. So, I mean, I understand that end too, and not all of it is, you know, it's no excuse for the toxicity on, on some of that end. Cause we've all had you know, that, that transition years. though. It's like, and that, these are the kind of lessons you bring with you when you get out yeah. is that making a decision. You know, and you're coming from the law enforcement world, the protector world or anything else is like one thing you learn in the military is whether or not you can make a decision. And the importance of making a snap 
right now decision, regardless yep. if it's going to be perfect or not. One of the things is that when people hesitate and they try to think everything through for that perfect solution, it never comes. Because by the time a perfect solution comes, the action's already been over with. And exactly. you know, when you're talking about life and death, loss of limb, it's got to happen now. You got to make a decision. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. That's um, I, more times than not, either hesitation in like when it's actually when a, a like kinetic type instance is happening. I'm thinking of um, specifically there's a suicide bomber incident to where in this kid's head, you know, this guy's approaching and he's telling him to stop. The guy's kind of looking weird and he knows something's wrong. He knows it like inside of him and inside of you. You're built in with a radar. Mm -hmm. You got to learn to listen to it. And he knows something's wrong. And if, you know, he's hesitating to the second yell to where the Afghan that's next to him decides to take action and racks. And that's when the guy puts his hands up. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, his initiators were these pressure plates on his uh, knees. And he goes to his knees and. Bah, bah. Oh, shit. Yeah. Tricky. They were using, they started using some crazy techniques as far as that. They're. Um, the anti-personnel mines that they would use, it was a sim like a simple setup. This is how you know that they were a decent team, like a bomb team, because it was a simple setup, but it was the way that they were emplacing them, masters at it. Like they would literally do techniques that like, like hunters use to like canal deer and stuff in a place mm -hmm. by using patterns of light and stuff. So you could start to see it in the in the pomegranate orchards that they were actually funneling you somewhere or like leading your eye mm -hmm. you know into there and it took a lot for you to start realizing and picking up on these flags and signs um yeah just tricky you know, tricky they're not you know, so you go you go think about it this way you go to war for a year 15 months you go back back you know you go here and there maybe two three four five six let's say eight tours but no yeah. these these bomb makers are living this life that's yeah, their that life. Is their life. Yep. You know, they've, they've grown into it. Yeah, they may have had a, a, like a, a decade or two for, between us and the Russians or whatever. But that's their life, man. Their life has always been war. And we know bomb making is a profitable business. And it's not always about jihad. It's always about doing, you know, the best thing that you want to do. And they become the best. They're getting a PhD in bomb making. And they yeah. pass on on information to, you know, Uncle Julio or whoever else is over there. And it's just generational. And it's just that is their job. It's like when you send people to prison, you know, reforming is great. But a lot of times you're getting a master's in criminality. You're getting a doctor in criminality, depending on what institution you go into. Same yep. thing with bomb making. Oh, yeah. But the other thing, too, is look at it this way. You go over there for a year as a combat troop and look at the lessons you learned. Look how that molded the rest of your life into pen and paper now. Yeah, uh, huge. Well, I should say keyboard. I mean, nobody's doing pen and paper. <laughs> can you imagine writing a book in pen and paper now? But now, oh, now you're now you're behind the keyboard. Brutal. It it's changed everything. It, it kind of transitions. Process through. with stuff though, like when you're putting together, like I mean, in my everyday business with marketing, or if I'm creating an outline and stuff, I don't do it with a computer. Um, it's too distracting. It literally, we're just, we're, we live in an age of information, mm -hmm. but at the same time, our creativity is hampered by, it's almost like over information. Well, you know, I, I'm glad you said that because they're starting to make these things. Well, actually I shouldn't say they're starting to make these things. They're essentially recreating the typewriter. They're making like these little WordPress, WordPress type things where you could just type. I've write. seen those and it's not connected to anything. I know exactly mm -hmm. what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, whenever I map out anything, I do a mind map and I use a piece of paper and I put my target in the middle and then I'm, I map it all out. Yep. And there's a lot of things you can't do on a computer that are because are, essentially writing is creative. You mm -hmm. have to have some. I mean, yeah, you could write professional documents and stuff. But when you're putting out fiction, even nonfiction, people want to read it. And if you're writing it so dry that it seems like a manual then you're probably better off in a different type of uh, medium. <laughs> yeah, right. So let's get into your your post-war 
You go to the reserves. Did you go to reserves guard? So I went over to the reserve side. I actually, um, when I left active and the whole reason I left active was actually, I, uh, I had a packet to go across the street to go work with the unit guys. And that was in to go try out over there. And then, the you know, who's not my wife was like, Hey, I'm pregnant. And I kind of, I weighed the two and I was like, look, these guys, there's only one, one path that you can take. You can't, you can't blend this. Not, not with that level. And I chose the, the choice of family. You know, so that's, that's the route I went. And, um, I ended up in the 450th civil affairs group, uh, right outside of Washington and really, um, the funniest part with that, they used me a lot. They used me heavily as far as the tactical trainer and uh, I would run the ranges, you know, first sergeant would grab, like grabbed me up and was like, Hey, you're my boy. <laughs> you're my boy blue. Real. But, uh, with everything else, like they were airborne as well, but I got word back from the VA, like six months after I was out of active and they're like, Hey, you're, you're deadline. You have all these, you know, you got hip dysplasia and you got all these other like issues. And I'm like, what, what? And they're like, yeah, we have no <laughs> idea. You, you should have been medically retired. Like, Oh my gosh. I was like, well, can we go back and do that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and the reserves kept me for another two and a half years, like unpaid as I'm, you know, I'm like, Hey, can you guys just release me? Like, are you mm-hmm. kidding me right now? And they kept me around. Like it was all just their command. So that way I was a little jaded about that little stint. I have that dream all, you know, I have these dreams. They pop up every few months. It's weird. I get recalled and I get <laughs> oh, sent no. to a car. I get, I get sent to, well, that's how I got, I got recalled from the IRR when I went to war. But now when I get recalled, I'm back and they make me an E4 because I resigned my commission. So I'm no Ooh. more longer Captain Piccolo. So, I'm an E4 and I'm always attached to some random guard unit and they won't let me go. And they're going to send me to some war unit. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, you're kidding me. And I'm always going back to like a Benning or, or somewhere else. And I'm like, I'm a specialist. I'm like, I'm fucking 50 years old. How are you right? going to do this to me? <laughs> so, oh, like, so like no. when I got out, when I got out, I, I remember getting hold of my branch manager. I think it was like, you know, I hate dating myself, but this was 06. I get a hold of him. I'm like, Hey, how do I resign my commission? They're like, well, fax this form into us. I fax a form into them. Literally, like a week later, I had an honorable discharge in the mail. It was like, boom, it was that quick. It was crazy. I wish I could See, find, I, find I, I think part of it was, too, is I was a little, like, after all this stuff and after all this is coming out, like, my old first sergeant that's in the book, he retired as a CSM, you know, and he's like, why, why the hell didn't you call me, man? Like, I could have made some calls for you. And I'm just like, mm-hmm. You just don't know. <laughs> You and know. that's where, and that's one thing we need to, uh, we need to transition into now too, is networking. Yes. All of this stuff in our community now is networking. Like you're on, the reason you're on a show is because my buddy Pete says, Hey, you know, you should interview Will. I'm like, okay, cool. But yeah. you have to use your market. You have to be a marketing and this is tough. And I know you're in this business. And that's one of the reasons I really want to talk to you today. I mean, I love your war story. I love your book and everything, but I really want to know about marketing. It is impossible. Well, I shouldn't say it's impossible. But I was going to say nothing's impossible. <laughs> no, the thing is like, it's so hard to sell yourself. I can sell it crap is. all day long. I don't really like selling things, but selling yourself is tough. Mm-hmm. And a lot of that has to be selling to the right market and knowing yep. your market and networking. So how did you get into marketing? So that was actually, that was a, res- that was a pivot in response to COVID. Um, I, there's, there's a little bit more behind it, but, um, I always wanted to go back and finish up business school. I had done a little bit in college. I kind of felt like the discipline that the military kind of gave me behind there was a, um, a good segue to within business. My, I grew up, my dad was, uh, he owned a business, you know, I knew, I knew what it entailed and I knew the work that it put in and I'm like, Hey, you know what? My background and stuff, and I did it in, in school too. You know, I mean, my background, I'll do the work. I might not even be the smartest guy in the room, but I will outwork. And I told my teams this in college too. I was like, I will outwork every single one of you guys. And it's the amount of um, 
you know, drive that you put behind it if you want something to succeed. But yeah, you're absolutely right. You have to hit the right people and finding those key points. And I think that that's part of that adaptation portion. Like this particular thing, um, you know, it's been frustrating. It's been a development the whole way. But from the very start, I noticed that a lot of authors and stuff out there and a lot of people, they go off of their personal pages. And I personally believe that that's one of the biggest mistakes they can make because hmm. people are fallible for one. Um, and for two, like if you create a movement and you make it about like you're amplifying other people's stuff like this book that I'm on the title, but honest to God, like every single one of those guys should be on there as well. And I tried to include every single one of them from that platoon in that book. Um, as well that was one of the things that they had kind of felt there was that other book that came out uh, there was another book is a uh, bravo company by ben castling that covers uh some of that same conflict area but the scope of it he was trying to accomplish something within the veteran space um in talking with people about veteran suicide through the particular story that mainly followed um one of my old squad leaders sergeant alan thomas and a lot of the guys just felt like they weren't included and that it wasn't the full story and it needed to all be out there. Um, and even though I love the book and stuff, I was like, you know, you're right. And that's how this thing came to be. But they all pitched in everything you see on social and everything. That's them. I had, I think, five, eight pictures, you know, and the publisher was like, hey, we want to put a picture insert in here. We need 30. Can you can you deliver? And I was mm. like, yep. Didn't even question it. I was like, yep. <laughs> and that's when I got frantic after they said yes. And I'm like, hey, guys, like, what do we got? <laughs> you know, marketing is the other thing I wanted to talk about with marketing, too, is <clears throat> being original or being authentic to yourself. Mm -hmm. Like you and I are both talking about like the bro vets, the vet influencers, the influencers out there. And it's easy to, you know, try to be something you're not to kind of embellish yep. and stuff. Yep. But how do you gain a following or gain traction being authentic in the marketing space? You know, it takes time. It takes time and it takes you fostering it. And that's why I started this so early. You know, the publisher was like, they questioned it. I started the uh, social media campaign back in February and they were like, you know, what are you doing? Like nobody ever starts pumping a book. People are going to lose interest. I'm like, no, I'm fostering. You know, and I'm I'm growing this thing, you know, and in the background the whole time, you know, you have those doubts from them and the other people and it gets real mm -hmm. quiet, it gets real quiet. And then, you know, the ones that kind of looked at you weird or laughed at you, then they start to and they start to get, you know, they're they're the ones that get quiet and then they start to pat you, you know, they're like, oh, well, this actually might do something, you know, and then when uh -huh. you start getting it, come back around, then, you know, you're getting that traction, but, but really it is like, I mean, there is a, there's a road and you can't give up on it. Um, cause I'll tell you right now that, uh, there's, there's times where I was like, there's no way, there's no way this thing's going to start pulling or pulling traction. And that's where you just have to be like, you know what, dude, you had a plan and you stick with the plan and you continue to drive on. And it's the exact same stuff that we did in the Valley. I like it, man. Well, you have to keep, stick with the plan. And that's a lot of times when, when you get to the social media and marketing, you kind of forget the big picture and you're trying to get like that thousand likes or the, the whatever and this and that. I Vanity found metrics. the more authentic you are, the yeah. more people are going to engage with you. Mm hmm. One of the guys um, that was there, he, we were talking the other day, actually, uh, John Culp, and he likened it to uh, taking a dowel rod. Okay, so like a perfect, perfectly aligned rod, and you put it up next to a wall that's crooked, you know, mm -hmm. and that's that's what it, it is, the measuring, and people notice it, and they can see it when you put it up next to the fake and the BS. Well, you know, the last, <laughs> you know, the last thing we need to talk about today is racing. Oh, you know, I went man. out to the Ridge, you know, I've been out to the Ridge. My buddy's got a little racing team out there, the after action racing. So I've been out there a bunch of times, man. I love, love racing out there. Yeah. Okay. Where's, where's the, the Ridge? Isn't the Ridge up in Washington outside of Seattle? 
Hmm. I'm not, I haven't, the West Coast, I, I'm not so familiar. I was oh, yeah. on like the yeah, Northeast region and yeah, yeah man. that's the, yeah. Boy, Lime Rock Park was really, I mean, so familiar. I was only, what, about half an hour from there. And I mean, that was, that was every weekend, you know, and uh, we would run what BMWs and ITS. And then uh, ultimately when I left there, I ended up doing um, rally. So I started off with a little two wheel drive Ford Escort. Oh, awesome, man. Yeah. Ridge <laughs> Motorsports Park. Okay. In okay. Shelton, Washington. Yeah, man. Well, with his, it's more like endurance. So it's like eight mm-hmm. hours on eight hours on Saturday or seven hours Saturday, eight, seven it's hours. It's no joke. Saturday. It's fun, man. It is. I love oh, yeah. it. Oh yeah. And that fostering, like that's part of the whole uh, racing mm-hmm. for heroes is like, you have to look, it's the same thing that we did. It's like that common goal. And you're taking guys and you're putting it together as a team and you're working together in these more stressful environments as Mm -hmm. a team to create that goal. And that is, you know, between doing something with a rally for the troops, you know, in, in getting guys into the cars and and getting them involved in rally racing, which is out in the woods, you know, which is where we love to be. be There's not a, Oh no, it's a blast. It's a blast. Come out sometime. We'll we'll get you a big time with the guys. And um, that's actually the paddocks are uh, at Virginia International. So VIR road, I'll drive. Exactly. Drive cheap, they, travel. Look them up. Um, Racing for Heroes. They they do stuff all the time. I know right around Thanksgiving, actually, they do holiday laps. Hmm. So they do that. They put some people on the track, and then they also have some stuff um, where they do some rally things, or at least they have in the past. I'm not sure what they're doing this year. I've been busy. <laughs> well, well, I appreciate you coming on, man. And I definitely want to have you back on. You know, we need, I need to start doing more roundtables. I need to bring, like, different perspectives from different people. And how we could, like, you know, not really market, but how do we sell? I guess that is marketing. But how do we sell? Uh, it's a little bit. I mean, you have sales, yeah. but then you have marketing. Like, marketing is the mass message. Where sales, like, I mean, if you're selling it to a particular. I'm to, what I'm, I'm trying to do is I'm trying to sell being authentic. I'm so tired of people who are just selling an ideal mm. like you know look at me i'm a former xyz and i'm the best thing since sliced bread you need to buy this product because of this i don't i don't want to see that i want to see authentic people now i want to listen to stories i want to hear from people i want to learn from people who have different perspectives and that's like one of the things i like about your book is as i was going through it i'm like i didn't read the whole thing yet but i'm gonna getting the different perspectives and then getting the different perspectives of you, like, you know, going through your process and then talking to you now and seeing how you've changed from like, you know, 26 year old you to 40 plus year old you. Yeah. So I appreciate coming on, man. Enjoyed this. No, it's been great. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. It's been fantastic. We definitely have to uh, get back out there as well as, um, you know, I mean, you're uh, you're invited to the museum event, by the way, on Veterans Day, I'm sure. You know, I know that's last minute, but um <laughs> Road but you know, track. next time we're I'm down at the track, I'll let you know. Uh, okay, man, definitely. Yeah. You know?